All right, it's Oscars time again, so uh, I'm going to talk about all of the Best Picture nominees and a bunch of the other nominees. And here's your reminder that I'll be doing an Oscars live stream on Sunday, March 10th. That is during the Oscars because we are streaming our reaction to the Oscars live. I do this every year with some friends, and it's the biggest stream that I do of the year every year. So uh, come join us. It'll be fun. You can watch either here on YouTube or on my Twitch channel. We've changed the Twitch brand to YMS plays just to make things more cohesive and uh, make sure you have your own way to actually watch the Oscars because we are just streaming our commentary. We are not streaming the actual video and audio of the Oscars, just our voices. Mark your calendars, Sunday, March 10th. We will be playing video games until the Oscars start and then we'll be doing the Oscars. Thank you. For our best picture nominees, we have Barbie directed by Greta Gerwig is the highest grossing film of 2023 at $1.4 billion right now worldwide. It beat the Mario movie, so uh, suck it. It is also nominated for Best Actor, Best Performance by an Actress in a Supporting Role, Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Production Design, Best Costumes, and two original song nominations. I very much enjoyed this movie. I've always thought that Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach make a good team. It's really great to see a studio put this much faith and investment into actual artists, people actually trying to express something and not just purely making a cynical cash grab. Now, there's a lot of conversation surrounding the fact that Greta Gerwig did not get a Best Director nomination and uh, Margot Robbie did not get a Best Actress nomination, but uh, Ryan Gosling did get a Best Actor nomination, and so people are going like, what? This is a feminist movie. You're supposed to nominate the women and not the men, uh, not the other way around. But not only did Ryan Gosling kind of steal the show, I mean, he was the most entertaining performance to watch in the entire movie, but those other categories are pretty stacked right now. If you're going to nominate Greta Gerwig for Best Directing, you're going to have to remove Christopher Nolan, or Jonathan Glazer, or Justine Trier, or Martin Scorsese, or Yorgos Lanthimos. It's not like any of them don't deserve to be there this year, and I'm not saying Greta Gerwig doesn't also deserve to be there, but no one making this argument ever really seems to talk about who they would get rid of to put her there. The Best Actress category is also pretty stacked. Annette Benning, Carrie Mulligan, Emma Stone, Stone, Lily Gladstone, and Sandra Hüller. Trying my best with the name pronunciations, I'm sorry. Personally, I think they should just allow more than five nominees per category. The Academy makes the rules. There's no reason why they can't change that. They did the exact same thing with Best Picture. It used to be five nominees. Especially since over the past decade, they've been hyper-conscious about what type of representation there is in any given category. They do not want another Oscars so white controversy. They want to make sure that there's female representation, especially in the directors and writing categories. So here's an easy idea. If you want to be more inclusive, just have more titles in each category. The biggest reason why you wouldn't see as much representation in any given year is because there aren't enough titles in each category. And it's not like you'd even have to account for higher capacity at the Dolby Theater in Los Angeles where they filmed the Oscars, because almost every single one of these nominees are from the same handful of movies anyway. If Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie were the sixth nomination in those categories, the number of people attending the Oscars would be no different, because they're already nominated for the film itself. Margot Robbie produced the film, so her name is on the list of Best Picture nominees. Greta Gerwig is also still nominated for Adapted Screenplay. So yeah, the Oscars are stupid, and they have OCD or something? I, I don't know why they just don't do more nominations. And to the people complaining that Margot Robbie and Greta Gerwig deserve nominations, uh, they have them, just not for the categories that I, I guess you care the most about. They are certainly not complaining about it. They already won the box office. It seems like a non-issue. It's the highest grossing film of the year. It's nominated for eight Oscars, and both of them are nominated. It really just seems like a controversy that's mostly driven by Twitter people that don't actually read the articles that they share and just look at the headlines. Probably people that weigh the categories of actor and director much higher than those other categories. I think that writing is pretty important. I think that, you know, best picture is obviously pretty important. It's not like they're not being celebrated for their work. Everybody calm down. It's okay. If Ryan Gosling wins, a lot of people will be upset probably, which is funny to me. He'll probably have to apologize during his acceptance speech. Everybody calm down. It's okay. I do find it kind of weird that Greta and Noah are in the best adapted screenplay category because it's 
it's adapted from the existing characters of Barbie. You know, Barbie by Mattel, that famous, well-fleshed-out story. It really doesn't make any sense, especially when in the original screenplay category, two of the films are based off of real people. Like, those are existing characters, right? How come those are not in the adapted screenplay category? It's not like they based the film off of, like, a Barbie book or something. The rules are stupid. I would honestly be happy with this film winning Best Original Song for the uh, I'm Just Ken song, because that was a fucking banger. I really hope the Billie Eilish track doesn't win. I've got nothing against her music, but I mean, it's just, it's not as great as the I'm Just Ken song. I, I don't understand why Billie Eilish is nominated, other than just, I guess they like her. America Ferreira in the supporting role category, I, I don't remember her performance being that standout. Like, it wasn't bad or anything. I, I just don't know if it would be top five of the year for me. I would say Margot Robbie definitely did a better job, but again, these are separate categories with separate competition. Margot Robbie would have been for actress in a leading role, not a uh, supporting role, so. Anyway, good, solid, fun movie. Uh, a lot of creative decisions. I loved the energy. I loved the comedy. I have a lot of more detailed thoughts on this film, but it doesn't make any sense to rehash them here, so if you want to hear my extended thoughts, please check out my Barbenheimer review. It's got my Oppenheimer and Barbie thoughts in there, as well as my podcast, Sardonicast. We talked about it there even longer, and uh, we had a special guest, Jay McCarroll from Nirvana the Band The Show, also talked about Barbie with us, so check that out. Barbie gets a 7 out of 10 from me. Thank you. American Fiction, directed by Cord Jefferson, is nominated for five Oscars. Best Picture, Best Actor in a Leading Role for Jeffrey Wright, Best Actor in a Supporting Role for Sterling K. Brown, Best Adapted Screenplay, and Best Achievement in Music Written for Motion Pictures. Honestly, Sterling K. Brown is the only part of this movie that I actually enjoyed. Maybe I'm a little biased because he was also really great in the film Waves by Trey Edward Schultz. I should probably rewatch that movie soon. I got a 4K now. Every other nomination for this film, honestly, uh, no thanks. The music genuinely sucked. It was very cheesy, very bland, very overpresent. The music is easily one of the worst parts about this film, so I have no idea why it's nominated. Jeffrey Wright was fine. I wouldn't really call it Oscar worthy. And the screenplay was not great. This is one of those weird movies where there are many meta layers to it, but the most interesting ones don't seem to be all that intentional. Throughout the film, they talk about the idea of people generally wanting something Something uncomplicated and not really refined, something easy and digestible, that's what the masses gravitate towards. Now you write really respectful. You've been doing complicated and refined books your entire life, but people just want something easy. They want the slop. It's like Johnny Walker. You see, this Johnny Walker, a lot of people buy because it's the uh, cheap one. But this Johnny Walker is like your books. It, like, they're complicated and thoughtful and intelligent, but people don't buy this one as much because it's expensive. Kind of seems like this is a bad analogy. Are your books that much more expensive? Because it kind of seems like people buy the cheaper one because of the price point. I had a very similar problem with A Star Is Born where they constantly drill the idea into our heads like, no, you just gotta be someone with something real to say. Like, it has to be you. You can't just be saying what everybody else is saying. You gotta be you gotta be doing something new. But the movie itself, I guess, just didn't realize that it's the third remake of this exact story, and it's starring Lady Gaga, and it was a fucking crowd-pleasing Oscar bait movie with nothing new to say. Like, what? Was that some sort of meta level narrative as well? Or are we gonna give a Star is Born that same level of credit? Like, oh, it's so self-aware like I don't know but this movie is exactly that like like it's just kind of slop it's a very bland basic easy to follow spoon-fed unoriginal crowd-pleasing obvious bottom of the barrel film and it never really feels like it's a parody of that type of film like it doesn't really feel like it's commenting on and criticizing itself in that way it's a very safe and unchallenging movie for old progressive white ladies or old liberal white ladies kind of the impression that I get. The few interesting concepts that exist in this
this movie have not only been done before, but are just not really handled in any kind of interesting way. Quite literally from the very first conversation in the film, no one was talking like real people at all. And even 30 minutes into the film, I was still waiting for a single character to talk like a real person at any point. This is unfortunately one of those scripts where every single character just talks like the writer, which again, maybe someone could interpret as some sort of meta layer commentary, but it really does not present itself that way. I really don't think that this film's level of self-awareness is anything close to that of the film adaptation. Now, this movie isn't absolutely terrible. It's just really mid and really repetitive and really unsatisfying and really uninteresting. For the entire second half of the film, my mind was essentially desperately trying to distract itself. I was thinking of so many other different things that were not this movie, and I honestly could not help myself. I was so completely checked out, I should have skipped it, and uh, I, I guess I watched it, even though it doesn't really feel like I did, I guess. Like, I was there, I, it just was not registering anything after a certain point. It, it was not happening. Very boring, very disposable, does not add anything new to any conversation. Apparently Spike Lee's Bamboozled is a lot better of a version of this, so uh, I'll check that out at some point. There were a lot of annoying product placements. Johnny Walker. This is a movie that certainly does not command your attention because it is not exceptional. It's very repetitive. It's very repetitive. It's also very repetitive. And repetitive. It's a repetitive film. I should have played Mario Kart while watching instead. My life is no different after having watched this film. And I'm giving this one a very generous 5 out of 10. I uh, am being nice to it. Uh, I was just completely checked out for the second half. So who knows? Maybe things were happening that uh, were fucking amazing. But basically, I, I was just mentally not even there. So whatever. Next up is Anatomy of a Fall, directed by Justine Trier. This is the 2023 Palme d'Or winner at Cannes Film Festival. It is also nominated for Best Directing, Best Performance by an Actress in a Leading Role, Best Original Screenplay, and Best Editing. Personally, I thought this movie was really great. It has a really strong story, so I'm happy about the Original Screenplay nomination. Honestly, I don't really disagree with any of the nominations that this film has. The acting was really fantastic, and Sandra Hüller did a great job. The actor who played her son was also surprisingly great. Usually I hate child or younger actors because they're less experienced and because directors don't take the proper time that they need to to work with them to get the right performance. People's standards are usually much lower for child or younger actors. Eh, it doesn't matter if they can act, they're just cute. What, are you gonna say a baby can't act? What, do you hate that baby? Are you, you're being mean to that baby right now. You're being mean. I, I've said this many times, when a child actor can't act, it's usually the adult's fault either for not properly working with them or for just doing bad casting. If the kid can't do the job, it's the adult's fault for putting them there. So massive props to Justine Trier for actually getting a great child performance in this movie. It's very rare. This was a very intelligent film with interesting choices in the editing and also the story structure, the way that information was shown or not shown, and the order in which information was revealed. It all made lots of sense for the story that they were trying to tell. It was very dramatic and substantive. I would highly recommend this film. It's a great courtroom drama type movie. It's about a woman who's trying to prove her innocence when accused of murdering her husband. There's so much going for it artistically and creatively. It's really captivating. I think most people would enjoy this film. So yeah, please check it out. If you want my more detailed thoughts on this film, please check out my TIFF 2023 review where I talk about it a bit more there. And I'm giving this one an 8 out of 10. It's closer to a 9 than a 7. Killers of the Flower Moon is nominated for 10 Oscars. Best Picture, Best Directing, Best Performance by an Actress in a Leading Role, Best Performance by an Actor in a Supporting Role, Cinematography, Film Editing, Production Design, Costume Design, Music for Score, and Music for Original Song. Overall, this film was good, but uh, I, I, it's not one that I think I'm ever going to watch again. It really could have been trimmed down a bit, and it's not that I dislike movies for being long inherently, it's just that 
this story didn't justify the length, which was not really an issue for The Irishman for me personally anyway, and that film was longer. Plenty of longer films that exist that I very much enjoy, but this film in particular felt like a two-hour story that they fit into three hours and 26 minutes. A lot of it was really repetitive and dragged on, and sure, there are some great performances in this film and some great directing overall, but it really was not enough for me to feel like, yeah, this is this is a three hour and a half long film that I would ever watch again. I was not a huge fan of the film's score. It also felt very repetitive. In terms of composition, it was really unspecial. And there's several points in the film where the tone of the score just felt so bizarre and conflicting. The tone of the music was just all over the place. A lot of it just felt really unintentionally goofy, and I'm not sure what they were doing. On top of that, there were a lot of issues with the audio in this film in general. There's some really genuinely sloppy audio editing in this film. Distracting white noise frequency when Jesse Plemons is talking through the door, and you can hear that frequency cut in and out. It's it's really just sloppy and unprofessional. I, I don't know how this happened. You Pinkerton, what are you? No, sir, I was a Texas Ranger. I'll go talk to the sheriff. He can probably tell you what you need to know. Oh, yes, sir, I have. I... I talk to him. There's a scene where characters are speaking into microphones on stage and it all sounds so perfectly clean. I had rather live a gray horse than any place on earth. I will be back with you before many moons. When that's not how microphones sounded in 1920s, just watch any Looney Tunes cartoon, you'll understand. Go still ain't big enough. And now you're a getting out of town. These aren't impossible feats, these these are just details, and it seemed like this movie was lacking a lot of detail, especially in the sound. There's a 2005 film called Capote that I watched recently, and there's a scene where Philip Seymour Hoffman is talking into a microphone, and this is also a period piece uh, from the 50s, and uh, it sounds a lot better and a lot more authentic, a lot more detailed. For this, for this evening's program, I'm going to read uh, some passages from the first three parts of my new book. This was also a film that was just constantly reminding me of other better things that I'd rather be watching or doing. There's a shot near the beginning of the film that is pretty much the exact same shot as from There Will Be Blood. Whether or not we want to call this an homage, it, it just reminded me of a better film, and I thought, wow, I wish I was watching There Will Be Blood. Oftentimes throughout the movie, I thought, I wish I was playing Red Dead Redemption. There's a lot that reminded me of that. There's some parts of this that reminded me of No Country for Old Men that's also a better movie that I would have rather been watching. Again, this isn't a bad movie. It's just not worth the runtime. For the first half of this film, so over an hour and a half, there were no great scenes. For a huge Martin Scorsese, Leo DiCaprio, Oscar-nominated film that's three and a half hours long, there should be some great scenes in the first half of it. But personally, there were none that really stuck out to me. It was, it was, it was all just fine. I appreciated some shots, some details. I, I loved Leo's performance, mostly. I really loved the production design. There were some editing choices that I really liked and a couple lines here and there that really connected with me. A couple choices in terms of what details to show about the environment and the setting. But there was no great scene for the first half of the movie. Nothing that I could really be wowed by and, and that's what I would hope for with this runtime. If I'm gonna watch a three and a half hour long movie, I, I want it to be one of the best movies ever, not just Scorsese made an okay movie and it gets better in the second half, but you really just have to wait for over an hour and a half for it to start really getting good. The way that this film just dragged on narratively for me in combination with it not really being able to shake that goofy-ass tone from the soundtrack and its confusing choices wound up making some parts of the film a little difficult to take seriously when maybe if it was in another movie it would be fine, I'm not sure. Things like Brendan Fraser's appearance in the film, the way it, the camera reveals him, it almost felt like kind of a Marvel moment, especially with him being like a pretty hot actor right now. There was something about his inclusion in this film that felt just so hilariously out of place. I don't know if he needed an accent or something, but I, I don't know what was going on. I was not able to take it seriously. It, it was pretty funny for me. I, I was I started to wake up a bit more during his scenes. For some reason, I was getting flashbacks to a clip from Shark Boy and Lava Girl. I demand the opportunity to Speak with Mr. This man cannot... I did not! Mr. Electric, send him to the principal's office and have him expelled! 
I'm not even sure if that's really a criticism of the film or his performance or anything. I, I just found that funny and wanted to share my experience that I had watching the film. It's a movie that really just did not feel like it was valuing my time at all. And uh, even though the second half of the film was much more interesting and flew by much quicker than the first half, I was just not completely into it. It was difficult to take seriously for much of the runtime. Loved the final shot of the film, even though the ending felt like it came out of nowhere pacing wise, but the final shot of the film I really love. Uh, yeah, I wish I could love this movie more. I really wanted to. I didn't go in wanting to hate it. If you want to hear my more detailed thoughts on this film, uh, I talk about it with Alex from I Hate Everything on my podcast, Sardonicast. We talk about it for a while, so go there if you want to hear me talk more about this. When I first saw this film, I gave it a high 6 out of 10, and uh, honestly, now, after sitting on it for three and a half months and not really remembering much of anything, except mostly just some issues that I had with it. I, I, I don't know if I can give it a high 6 out of 10. We're gonna, we're gonna bump it down to a low 6 out of 10. It's closer to a 5 than a 7. Take that. Maestro, directed by Bradley Cooper, is nominated for seven Oscars. Best Picture, Best Actress in a Leading Role, Best Actor in a Leading Role, Best Original Screenplay, Best Achievement in Cinematography, Best Sound, and Best Achievement in Makeup and Hairstyling. And honestly, this movie is just shit. It's so, so terrible. It does not deserve to be at the Oscars. It feels like a parody of an Oscar bait movie. A very unintentional parody. It uh, might be the most boringest movie ever made of all time forever. It absolutely reeks of narcissism. It is utterly pointless. It seems like it only exists so that Bradley Cooper can get nominated for Oscars. He really wants to win some Oscars, I guess. This film has single-handedly changed the way I feel about Bradley Cooper. I had always been relatively neutral. I, I didn't really have strong feelings feelings for or against him. Now he seems like just a huge asshole, just based on this movie. <laughs> he seems like an absolutely psychotic narcissist. This film is so fucking full of itself. Imagine the most masturbatory film that a film school student would make and then give it, I guess, a big budget and name actors and uh, give it a bunch of Oscar noms and you have this movie. It is one of the most obnoxious, disgusting, disgusting, pathetic films ever made. There are zero likable characters with zero chemistry, and the film doesn't realize this. It is very much not aware of what it is. There are sequences where it thinks it's the fucking artist or some shit. It would be one thing for this film to just not be impressive, but the fact that it's displaying itself as though what it's doing is impressive makes it absolutely absolutely unbearable. It makes it an irritating and joyless experience. There's a bunch of fake looking CGs and pretend oneers. Wow, look at how big and coordinated we are, even though we look like shit. It's all for nothing. We're not saying anything new. We're not adding to the language of cinema. We're not adding to culture. We're not adding to any kind of conversation or entertainment. We made what we think an Oscar movie is, and I guess this is an Oscar movie. I, I guess it really is that easy, as evidenced by things like the short film Skin that one year. Like, that was basically just, hey, I wonder if we can trick the Academy into giving us an Oscar, and uh, it happened. It really is that easy sometimes. I hope this doesn't win anything. It doesn't deserve to be here. It is in a completely different category than all the other nominees. It honestly feels as if it was made just entirely selfishly just to prop up Bradley Cooper's ego. There's a lot of people saying that the performances were great in this film. I wasn't offended by Carrie Mulligan. I don't know if I would put it top five of the year. She's great. Like, d don't get me wrong. She's able to cry in some scenes. She does that well. And what I could tell, I, I think her accent was mostly consistent. It's sometimes difficult to judge when every single line is so boring and pointless and in service of nothing. And you hate the characters because it's in service of nothing. Bradley Cooper apparently learned how to conduct for this movie. That's a part of, of his campaign 
for the Oscars. He says, please give me an Oscar. I learned how to conduct. Again, not really in service of anything. The entire sequence where he's conducting, it just absolutely reeks of self-importance. The way the camera moves, it's as if it's constantly begging, like, aren't you, aren't you impressed? Look how impressed you should be. And I'm, I'm just waiting for it to be in service of something. I'm waiting for it to be a purposeful, motivated choice in this film. There's a lot of camera movements that don't feel particularly motivated outside of, hey, this is the Oscars scene. This is the Oscars shot here. There was one of the moments where uh, the two characters are arguing and it's like, oh, okay, this one is in one take and you're you're doing the Oscars dramatic clip that they can use in the, the performance parts. I'm very impressed uh, is I guess what you want me to be saying right now. I spend the entire movie just waiting for it to mean something, but all it means is just, hey, uh, Oscars, please. Excuse me, Academy, I would like, I would like an Oscars, please. I would like an Oscars, please. It's all so fucking desperate and and pathetic and embarrassing. Bradley Cooper's performance is odd. Hello, children of Zeus! Attacks <laughs> oh, before the deluge. You? Hello, hello. <laughs> you know, I slept with both your parents. <laughs> <laughs> too much, isn't it? Too much. I love too much, what can I say? But I'm reining it in. I'm reining it in! There are sequences of the film where it sounds like his nose is blocked the entire time. Felicia puts it together. Oh, if I was like to buy the devices, I would be dressed like a clown. That could be because of his prosthetic nose, which was the subject of controversy. Regardless, no amount of makeup is changing the fact that it still very much looks like Bradley Cooper. It very much feels like Bradley Cooper. This is definitely not a uh, train transformation into the character situation like it seems he wants people to feel about this he did a weird voice throughout the movie Manfred starts with a downbeat rest and you didn't get me to rehearse with the orchestra well, I'll tell you fellas I don't remember a thing after that downbeat rest I must have blacked out and then when the audience applauded I came too but you're actually studying acting and that is a career which demands the versatility to play a panoply of characters and that is my conclusion it just never felt natural it always felt like a fake voice he was putting on his accent in this film comes off about as naturally as that classic cringe campus guy who carries scraps of metal wrapped in a Norwegian flag in his pocket oh my oh my well it's going chillfully thus far. This is also another one of those biopics where you look up how the real person in real life talked in interviews, and you learn that that is not at all how Bradley Cooper was talking. New key, a shifting meter, a sudden new counterpoint. But that's the Beatles, always unpredictable and a bit more inventive. Literally nothing, it doesn't sound anything like him. I guess Will Smith won an Oscar for doing that also, so who knows, maybe they'll give it to him. The Academy seems to have this weird boner for biopics. A lot of people do, I guess. Honestly, this could have been a documentary, probably would have been a lot more interesting. They probably would have chosen much more interesting parts about his life and legacy to cover, which is really what I hear as a critic criticism from people who are fans of Leonard Bernstein is that they don't talk about any of the interesting parts of his life or legacy. Could have been a documentary, would probably have been much more interesting. Sarah Silverman was in the movie. She was terrible. She was very annoying, very distracting. She stinks. <laughs> I doubt it. It was very difficult to watch her anytime she was on screen. I did not want to exist in real life. I mean, Minecraft in Minecraft life. Now, I'm not going to deny that writing and directing and starring in a feature like this is ambitious. Obviously, it is very ambitious, but I just wish it was in service of something real. This is fake, phony, pretend art to the extreme. How on earth can you make a film about a real-life composer and make it so fucking uninteresting? You could genuinely take anyone else's life on earth and make a much more interesting interesting movie out of it than this. Like, literally anybody. There's ways to make anything compelling. Jean Diamant, compelling film. Maestro, not a compelling film. This film has no energy, it has no purpose, it has no life, and with an hour left in the film, I chose the 1.5 times speed option on Netflix, which
which is the platform that this film is distributed on. So thank you for the option, Netflix. Much rather would have had something like 10 times speed on this one. Maybe you can update it just for this movie, really. Thank you for making the second half of this film slightly more bearable. I was in a real get me out of here situation. I didn't do anything. Afa, help me. Apparently some people were calling this tar at home, so I rewatched tar after this film. Bumped it up from a 9 to a 10. Incredible movie. Didn't really feel like Maestro was much like tar at all, but it was a good excuse to revisit tar anyway. Tar didn't win any Oscars, so I think it's only fair that this also doesn't win any Oscars. That would be nice, honestly. The cinematography nomination is pretty fucking embarrassing. It seems as though as long as you make a movie that's Oscar bait and it's in black and white, you're gonna get a cinematography nomination. I guess that's how it works. Fucking Nebraska got a cinematography nomination. Oh, wow, it's black and white. What a, what an interesting choice you made for the film. That's it. Wow, it's four by three. Not at the beginning or the end, but in the middle it is. That's very cool. Two out of 10 for this film because I would honestly feel dirty giving it a three. So fuck this movie. It's a real uh-oh stinky type film and I'm done. Oppenheimer, directed by Christopher Nolan, is nominated for 13 Oscars. Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor in a Leading Role, Best Actor in a Supporting Role, Best Actress in a Supporting Role, Best Adapted Screenplay, Cinematography, Editing, Production Design, Costume Design, Makeup and Hairstyling, and Music and Sound. Huge Oscar movie, huge epic movie, huge IMAX movie. It's a big movie about a real historical event and that makes it even huger. It's a Hugo movie. I don't know where I was going with that. Hugo is not in the movie, and this movie is not Hugo. There is a lot to talk about in this film, and I have a lot of opinions on many things in this film, but I've already talked about it pretty extensively in my Barbenheimer review and also on my podcast, Sardonicast. So go watch those if you want more than this little blurb that I'm offering here. I found half of the movie compelling and half of the movie boring, and the movie is really long, so to be bored for that amount of time is not great. I'm not a history buff. It doesn't matter to me whether or not it's a real event that actually happened. I'm just judging the film. Killian Murphy was amazing. There's some genuinely incredible makeup, especially near the end of the film. I watched it in 70 millimeter IMAX. The cinematography was pretty great overall. There were some sound design choices that I did really like. The score was pretty great for the most part, aside from some exceptions that seemed to be mostly because of how it was edited in the film. Was not a huge fan of the editing in this film. There was a lot of it. Half of the movie was edited like a trailer and the other half like a normal movie. Movie. It was very odd. A lot of the dialogue felt very unnatural, and this was a combination of both the writing and the editing. Great production design. There's a lot of really talented people that worked on this project, and there is some incredible filmmaking within this film. Personally, I feel as though its ideal version is somewhere in the editing room, preferably at least an hour shorter, and I don't say this because I don't like long movies, I say this because it was really repetitive. A lot of information was established multiple times without adding anything new to it or building on top of it. It was just kind of repeating itself. Maybe I'll watch it again. I'm not sure. It's uh, way too long, so probably not. It's a 6 out of 10 that I'm never gonna see again. Past Lives is directed by Celine Song and is nominated for two Oscars, Best Picture and Best Original Screenplay. Honestly, I thought this movie was pretty great. It is very simple and contained, but is very well presented and well written. It's obviously not a huge budget movie, so it's really incredible what they were able to do with it. The performances are fantastic and some nominations for those would not feel out of place. I also really loved the cinematography of this film. I thought it looked fantastic. It's super well shot, but refrains from feeling show-off-y. It's smart. It has watchable characters that I actually care about. It is a super impressive first feature, and I'm excited to see whatever she makes next. If you want to hear me talk about it for a bit longer, there's a short review here. You see it? This one gets an 8 out of 10. Poor Things, directed by Yorgos Lanthimos, is nominated for 11. Oscars. It's quite a bit because I honestly expected this one would be a little too edgy for the Oscars. I wasn't exactly sure that it would get this recognized, but it's my favorite film of the year, so I'm pretty happy about that. Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actress in a Leading Role, Best Actor in a Supporting Role, Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Achievement in Cinematography, Best Editing, Best Production Design, Best Costume 
costume design, best makeup and hairstyling, and best music original score. Not a single one of these is unwarranted or undeserved. This is an absolutely incredible film. Every single element is everyone working at their A game. And every single person in this project is just so well fitted for their role. Emma Stone absolutely kills it in this movie. This is easily my favorite Mark Ruffalo performance ever. The screenplay is fantastic. It's very entertaining and there's a lot to pick up from it thematically. There's a lot going into the writing that makes this film perfect to think about after you've seen it. It's a great film to discuss and I'm sure that there's so much more that I'll pick up on a second watch. Characters are well written and purposeful. It is super well paced. I love the editing in this film. There's very distinct choices that are memorable and unique. The production design is incredible. There is so much personality to how this world is presented. The cinematography is cranked up to 11. It's aggressive and it absolutely works for this film. A very bizarre and dreamlike and disorienting look for this film. The costumes are fantastic from what I can tell. I'm, I'm not like a, a costume kind of person, but, but you know. Makeup and hairstyling, very well deserved, particularly the prosthetics on Willem Dafoe. The original score for this film is fucking insane. I go into quite a lot of detail about it in my Poor Things spoiler review here. I talk about the movie for quite a bit, so go there if you want more than just this summary. Super well composed, super well realized, super fitting. Everything just comes together perfectly for this film. And Lanthimos directing this project, he absolutely just hits it out of the park, out of the fucking city, onto the moon or some shit. Amazing film. Again, check out the spoiler discussion. I talk about this movie at length, and I also talk about it on the podcast. 10 out of 10, I'ma see it again. The Holdovers, directed by Alexander Payne, is nominated for five Oscars. Best Picture, Best Actor, Best Actress in a Supporting Role, Best Original Screenplay, and Best Achievement in Film Editing. As is the case with some other Alexander Payne movies, this film had me in pain. And it's not a terrible movie, it's just so forgettable. It is a by-the-books, paint-by-numbers story that is very familiar and unchallenging. You can pretty much just predict the entire rest of the movie from the 20 minute mark. You don't have to finish it. If you just know where it's going, you can just be like, oh, okay, well, let me just imagine the rest of the movie instead. I did enjoy the visual style. I loved the 70s film look. Paul Giamatti is great. I enjoyed his performance quite a lot. Davine Joy Randolph was honestly pretty great. I really enjoyed watching her character. She was one of the best parts of the movie. There was nothing in particular that stood out to me about the editing in this film, so I'm just not really gonna comment on that, I guess. The overall experience, it really really just kind of feels like Oscar bait. The writing was definitely the most annoying part. Lots of really obvious alcohol product placements that even made their way into the script multiple times. Anyway, if you want to hear me talk about this movie a little bit more, check out my Toronto Film Festival 2023 review. There's also another funny clip on the YMS Clips channel where I talk about my theater experience in the film. I didn't put that in my TIFF video because I, I just thought it would be too long, but it's pretty funny, so check that out. Anyway, this is definitely not my kind of movie. I could imagine a lot of other people really loving it, but it's not for me. I need something a bit more distinct and memorable. This was just a very long and boring experience. It is an absolutely forgettable film for me. Five out of 10, not seeing it again. The Zone of Interest is directed by Jonathan Glazer and is nominated for five Oscars. Best Picture, Best International Feature, Best Director, Best Adapted Screenplay, and Best Sound. And this is a film where I feel as though it easily could have and should have gotten nominated for more categories. The cinematography in this film was absolutely mind-blowing and incredible. You could easily just bump out Maestro for this one. That would be a pretty easy decision to make for the cinematography category. I talk a lot on this channel about me being the type of person that loves films that get you to think about how they're presented and not necessarily just what's being presented. And this is one of the absolute best examples of a film that fits that description. This is a film that really gets you to engage with what it's trying to say, that makes you think about the choices it's making in terms of how it's presenting itself and what the film is saying through those choices. Not only the visual style, but the choices of what to show and what not to show. It is all very purposeful and unique. And I love seeing a film that takes risks that really pay off. I am also quite peeved that it does not have a nomination for Best Original Score. You could easily bump out John fucking Williams for the new Indiana Jones score. And you could also easily bump out American Fiction in that category. Absolutely shameful. Mika Levi is one of the most talented composers working in the industry right now. They are the same composer as Under the Skin and Jackie. Super creative, super expressive, super well-realized. Get them an 
Oscar. Get to it, okay? Perhaps it wasn't nominated because it didn't show up in much of the film, but still, when it was used, it was not only super appropriate in terms of choice, but the music itself sparks an immediate emotional reaction out of me. It was very intense. Sandra Hüller could have had a nomination for this, but I guess she's nominated for Anatomy of a Fall. All of the performances in this film were pretty fantastic, so they would not feel out of place getting nominations. The writing and directing is obviously incredible, and I really hope that this one wins Best Sound, especially now that the category is actually called Best Sound and it's not specific to mixing or editing. It, it involves all of the sound and the sound choices in the film. Because this film is very much about the sound, so I guess we'll see if it goes to the zone of interest or the loudest movie. Either way, I'm glad it at least got a nomination for that category. This is an absolutely haunting, thought-provoking experience. I also talk about this in my TIFF 2023 review, so check that out if you want to hear a little bit more. I am very looking forward to a second watch for this film, and right now it's a 9 out of 10. It could easily get a 10, I think, on a second watch. We shall see. I am not committing to that, but we'll see. As for now, I can at least confidently say that Jonathan could glaze my zone of interest any day. I'm sorry. Sorry for that one. I had to say it. It was just, it's right there. Sorry. And that's it for the best picture category. So let me go over some other categories that are of interest. Let's talk about the best animated feature film category. The Super Mario Bros movie was nominated for zero Oscars. Suck it. It's bad. Elemental was nominated for best animated feature, and it is the worst Pixar movie ever made, in my opinion. Yes, worse than The Last Dinosaur which happens to come from the same director. This is Pixar and it's... <laughs> I said the last dinosaur. Uh, that's funny. I don't even care. This is Pixar at its absolutely least charming, least engaging, least interesting, least funny, and most annoying. The character design is absolutely atrocious. The fire people honestly look like some PS3 graphics shit. These are all ugly ass characters. They're all presented really uncreatively. The way that characters emote in this film is just so fucking bland and expressionless. Much of it resembles something that's outsourced or cheaply made or even auto-generated. The film's universe universe is just so bland and uninteresting. It genuinely feels like they're just scraping the bottom of the barrel for concepts at this point. This film pretends to be a Romeo and Juliet love story, but there is absolutely zero fucking chemistry between these characters, and this is made much worse by the fact that there's no fucking voice talent in this film. Everyone's performance is fucking terrible. One of the main characters is played from a guy that had a really small role in Jurassic World Dominion, and he also sucked in live action, so I, I guess he's just bad, or is, is taking very bad projects, working with really bad directors, and is really unlucky. It took Fish and Wildlife three years to catch the T-Rex. Her name means fear nothing. Well, I guess you know that. <laughs> Every single other large budget animated movie I can think of at the very least has notable or talented or experienced voice actors. And sure, maybe there are some people in this cast that I'm not as familiar with that are secretly very talented, but it did not show in this film whatsoever. The Fire Dad's voice acting is absolute shit in every single line. Sometimes customer can be tough. Just take breath. Now that you've beaten my time, there is only one thing you haven't done. I wake up and nobody upstairs. We're lucky nobody hurt. It ruined Red Dot Sale. Did he do this? When there's not a single competent voice performance to be found, that's the sign of a bad director. The dialogue in this film feels like something that was written in Chinese and then auto-translated back to English. <gasps> Water. The humor in this film is absolutely humorless. There are so many attempts at gags and none of them come even close to landing. Oh, I just dabble in watercolors, or as we like to call them, colors. Oh, don't listen to him. <laughs> you knocked over three tons of cement dust. Half the guys still haven't recovered. I guess you could say they still have hard feelings. <laughs> oh, come on, I'm your mother. I know when something's lighting you up. I just didn't know she'd be so smoky. 
<laughs> when the film released in theaters, Pixar posted this absolutely bizarre ad to their Instagram page, where they're trying to promote the character Claude by doing an absolutely terrible looking fake phone camera recording of a theater experience that didn't happen. Like, it's just really bad editing. It doesn't look like a phone recording at all. The audience laughter and cheering is obviously fake. This doesn't seem to be some sort of ironic, self-aware, Tim and Eric style skit. What the fuck were they going for? Yo, yo, yo! Yeah! And this is a character that only shows up maybe twice in the movie, and it's just to deliver more awful puns. If you were a vegetable, you'd be a cucumber. An act of God or an act of Claude? He had no purpose in the story whatsoever. I don't understand why they were trying to market the film with this. And the absolutely atrocious writing does not end with the awful puns and failed gags. Even the basic narrative of this film is so poorly motivated, it's insulting. So the Fire family is only living here because even though they used to live in the Fireland area, their house got hit by a sandstorm, so they had to leave. And they never explained why they couldn't just rebuild or rent another place there. Why did you have to go on the boat to the other place? It seems like your house was the only one that got hit. It's not like the place that you came from is uninhabitable to you anymore. I, I don't understand. So they set up a family-owned business in this not fireland, and the story starts functioning as a really obvious allegory for immigrants and prejudice. Water. Keep an eye on them. So because Lava Girl, I guess, can't control her temper sometimes when she gets overwhelmed by too many people being in the store, uh, the pipes burst, and I guess she almost dies, and the water guy comes out, and he's a city inspector, and he's like, I guess your pipes are not up to code, I guess we have to shut your business down, and she's like, no, don't do that, and she chases after him, and then he winds up uh, sending the letter, and then it's like, oh no, the business is gonna shut down unless I do something nice for the city. Not exactly sure why they had water running in the pipes anyway, if they never use water and it can kill them. I think there's a line somewhere where the dad briefly mentions, like, oh, why why do we even have water in this place? We don't use it. And they're like, oh, because it was here before we got here. Why is water with pipes? City shut down years ago. There should be no water. The city seems pretty fucking technologically advanced, so I don't know why they don't have something as simple as a main water shutoff valve, a thing in buildings that you have when you have water running through pipes in buildings. Are they forced to pay for the water? I guess so. Also, when the water guy showed up, he was just crying the whole time, and I guess it was supposed to be funny that he's always crying and he's also very stupid and is like, oh, isn't it funny that he's stupid and crying and buff, I guess? Absolutely bizarre and unrelatable attempts at humor. So eventually Lava Girl realizes that she can heat up sand to make glass, so she prevents uh, an accident. There's a dam. I think she was responsible for breaking it. I don't remember. But she uses a bunch of glass to fix the potential catastrophe of the water uh, getting through this door, dam, what whatever whatever's going on here, and the looming threat of the business potentially shutting down is resolved at the hour mark in the film. So now it's just mostly a romance movie, and at one point she said something like, oh, when I was a child, I never got to see a vivisteria. It's like a plant or something that doesn't exist anymore. And he's like, oh, I'll help you see the vivisteria. There's one that's underwater in this place, and if we make a bubble and the cloud person uh, blows, then you will have enough oxygen to last for a certain amount of time. And she's like, oh, well, I finally got to see the vivisteria. And then the, they leave, and it's just like, oh no, the bubbles, die. you're gonna die. I help, but they escape, and she's fine, and she's like, oh, thank you, I love you so much, we are in love now, and Shark Boy says, I'm so lucky to have you, and because he said the word lucky, she remembers the line from her dad also saying the word lucky, I'm so lucky I have you, which causes her to suddenly remember that she has to take over the family shop the next day, which apparently means that she can't date him? No, I can't run a shop and date you at the same time, it's not possible, and then they get mad at each other, which is already an annoying trope in these types of films right between the second and third act, like, oh, we hate each other now. The absolute worst examples are when it comes out of fucking nowhere. It's a particularly annoying trope because it often feels inorganic to the characters. Like, oh, we're just checking a box on the 
script, you have to do this so that there's a low point before they save the day at the end and things are happy again because that's how you make a movie and you can only make a movie one way, you can only have a script one way and nothing else matters. And this genuinely might be the absolute worst instance of this that I've ever seen. Ever. It's as if it's a parody of itself. Like, oh, thanks for fulfilling this thing that I've been wanted to do since forever, since I was a child and I love you, but oh, I just remembered I'm mad at you, actually, and uh, we I, we can't do this. I, I completely forgot everything that I was supposed to do tomorrow, and I'm I'm mad at you now. We're mad at each other. Uh, we, we Yeah, this is, this is a thing that has to happen, apparently. And it continues as she shows up at the shop, and even her mom is like, no, it's true love. It's love. It's true love. And she she still insists on completely ending the relationship, and she's just, I, you can't understand this character. Also, here's some really cringy lines from this scene. What kind of food inspection is this? A food inspection of the heart, sir. We touched, and when we did, something happened to us. Something impossible. We changed each other's chemistry. Then something happens, I think the dam breaks and there's water and she's like, no, I can't leave the ever flame or whatever the fuck this is. Like, it's very important. It's the longest flame that's ever had a flame for in time. And he goes in to save her and she's trapped and he saves her. And it's a whole Will Smith, I am legend. Like I'm sacrificing myself for you because it's like, no, you'll evaporate if you stay in here. And they just decide that him evaporating would mean that he dies. The water will come in and you'll be snuffed out. But you're evaporating. I don't know what to do. It's okay. But I can't exist in a world without you. They never established this up until this point. It doesn't make any sense. They're just insisting that this would be the case. And they do a whole fake out where they pretend he's dead and they're like, oh, I'm so sad that he's dead. And the words that she says out loud are just so sad that it makes him cry himself back into existence again. Like, like he was in the rock and he was able to hear her, I guess, the whole time. But it's a happy ending and it doesn't matter where it came from and it doesn't matter how we get there and it doesn't matter what we do we're just doing it we're insisting that this is the case congratulations this is an astonishingly awful terribly written and unsatisfying story and every single molecule of this film just breathes an infinite amount of creatively bankrupt insincerity yummy yummy corporate bullshit from an art factory my favorite also i forgot to mention the music sucked the only parts of the score that sounded halfway decent were incredibly derivative it was insistent, it was annoying, it was distracting. Every single thing in this movie just absolutely sucked. This was an embarrassing new low for Pixar. I have no idea why it was nominated, probably because it made more money than Wish and it's Disney and you gotta put a Disney movie there. The Academy doesn't even watch the movies that they vote on and this is especially the case for animated movies. Absolutely unacceptable. This is one of the absolute worst major release kids movies I've ever seen. Embarrassing. Awful, 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 cringe. Terrible. This was a 1 out of 10. Fuck this movie. Why is it nominated for anything? It shouldn't be nominated for anything. Didn't even watch the Ninja Turtle movie, but I can assume that that would have been a much better pick. Or even Leo, honestly. Any animated movie the entire year would have been a better pick. So after watching Elemental and realizing that Disney also released another movie called Wish, I had to watch it because I genuinely could not understand how Wish could be any worse than this. And I was right, it's not a good movie. In fact, it's a pretty bad movie, but there are some competent aspects to it, which is way more than Elemental is offering. Here's a really quick review in case you're curious. I enjoyed that they at least tried to have a distinct visual style with this film, but unfortunately the way it functioned just felt poorly realized. The I attempted having the textures and particularly the backgrounds look like paintings would have been an excellent opportunity at showcasing some really vivid and detailed and interesting art pieces, but unfortunately most of it just looks like a crappy, low-effort filter. It really brings into question the motivation for this stylistic attempt. Is this just Disney trying to do their own Spider-Verse type thing? I'm actually glad I watched this film because it really got me thinking about the differences between something like this and something like Puss in Boots The Last 
Last Wish, there was something really off about the way characters moved in this film, and I realized that they were missing something very important to help with the flow of motion. Most computer animated films add blurring effects to add to the illusion of motion, since that's what happens in live action films. If you pause one of these films during a rapid motion, you'll see that it is not a crisp and clear image with hard outlines of the character. It is an artificial blur that they add to animated films to make movements feel more natural. 2D animated films often add speed lines or motion lines or action lines or whatever you want to call them. And stylized computer animated films like Puss in Boots The Last Wish wound up creating that in a 3D space. Disney's Wish just seemed to have not bothered with any of these options and I don't know why. Maybe someone forgot? Don't get me wrong, this isn't an objectively wrong thing to do in animation, but it is something I picked up on that explains why so much of this film just felt visually jarring. One of the problems with this film is that despite being a musical with many songs in it, the overwhelming majority of them do not feel properly motivated. They'll sing a song and then some stuff will happen and then they'll sing another song and by the time you're at the other song you're like, wait, nothing happened? Every time they sing a new song it feels like nothing happened since the last one. Many of the lyrics in these songs feel absolutely meaningless. There aren't any likable characters and the story is uninteresting. One of the songs has a chorus that's just like, you're a star. What exactly does that even mean? Like, what motivated these lyrics to take place? The songs should be helping the story to move forward, but there's barely any story, so it just winds up feeling like we're taking another song break from nothing. That being said, despite how terribly the songs were used in the film, there were no terribly composed songs removed from the film's context. Again, the lyrics are not great, but at least one of the songs actually sounds pretty dope. One of the songs that they heavily promoted in the marketing for this film was a quote-unquote villain song, but the tone of the song just does not match the visuals. It does not match the story. And this is the thanks act! <laughs> Also, I'm not exactly sure what Disney thought this movie was. There's a couple parts where they introduce member berries. Like, remember these other Disney characters? Hey, thanks for not eating me, John. Don't mention it, Bambi. It's all good. And the entire end credits sequence of the film is just every main Disney character ever. Like, even Home on the Range and Chicken Little are there. Okay, is this some sort of finale? Are you done? I think this was for, like, the 100th anniversary or some shit. I don't remember, and I'm not gonna to look it up. I want to stop talking about this. Here's an out of context clip that I laughed really loudly at. <laughs> they did it. She's also fine. Like, she should be dead or at the very least concussed or have broken bones. Oh yeah, there was also this really funny moment where the villain destroys the wishes of three Randys and it cuts to one of them and they say, <laughs> The story is not even worth repeating. It doesn't matter. It's bland. It's forgettable. But at the very least, this film had voice acting talent, like voice actors to help bring the characters to life. People who can perform, they read the lines and it doesn't sound like absolute ass every single time. So yeah, if they absolutely had to pick a Disney film to get nominated this year, then this should be it. But this one didn't make as much money. So uh, I guess that's what the Academy made their decision based on, I don't think that they watched these films. 3 out of 10. Never seen it again. Nimona is nominated for Best Animated Feature Film, and it is available on Netflix. This was apparently the project that Blue Sky Animation Studios was going to make before Disney bought Fox and shut them down. Now, I watched this film after Elemental and Wish, so it was immediately refreshing. Sure, the character models and textures are fairly simple, seemingly for budgetary reasons, but it really makes it work with its style. And it was so incredibly relieving to see actual cinematography and story storyboarding and motivated camera movements. Things that were very difficult to find in the previous two animated films that I had watched. This film also had actual voice talent. The vocal performances were really well done. They were consistent and they had lots of character. It's honestly just really cool watching something that actually has a vision and is actually trying. The musical score for the film was also very enjoyable. There were some really fun and exciting sequences with some really good choices for tone. 
There were also plenty of playlist songs in the film, but they never felt super unjustified or annoying. The sequences that exist in this film are all very competent and well realized. There's a bunch of different animal character designs in this film, and I like that they actually put a lot of thought into how these characters were animated. The way that this otter walks is hilarious. It's a great choice, and I love that they actually put thought into it. Overall, this movie was very enjoyable, and although I wasn't completely invested in everything that it had to offer, I do appreciate its efforts, and there are a lot of smart choices that actually paid off. Sure, not every single joke lands, and sure, there are some parts that make it feel tonally inconsistent, but overall, this was a very good animated film. And I'm giving this one a high 6 out of 10. It's closer to a 7 than a 5. Robot Dreams is a Spanish-French produced animated film, and there is no dialogue in the entire film, so it's not like there's a language barrier issue or anything. It is nominated for Best Animated Feature, obviously. I love the style and character to this film. It is very much a love letter to 1980s New York. There's some great animation, some great sound design, and it's very effective at communicating the emotions that it's trying to. It's a very happy, feel-good movie, but it's also a very sad movie. It's very cute, very funny, very entertaining. There are some parts where narratively I wish it went a bit of a different direction, and also pacing and structure-wise, there's a lot that could have been cut out of this movie without it really affecting anything. If you cut out like 15 minutes, it would have been a bit more short and sweet. Still a very enjoyable experience that I will definitely watch again. If you want to hear me talk about this a bit more, you can watch my TIFF video. I saw this at TIFF. 7 out of 10. So yeah, definitely check this one out. Apparently it's not getting a proper US release date until May 31st, 2024. So you're going to have to wait a bit. Oops. But yeah, check it out. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is nominated for Best Animated Feature. You guessed it. Love the animation. Love the style. It's cranked up to 11. A lot of the issues that I had with the first film are not really issues in this film. Very fun villain, great pacing, lots of energy. I already reviewed this one. If you want to hear me talk about it more, watch the quickie. Thanks. 7 out of 10. Good movie. The Boy and the Heron, the newest Miyazaki Ghibli film. It is nominated for Best Animated Feature, and it does the things that Ghibli films do, but with much less of a story and characters that I care about when you compare to things like Spirited Away or Princess Mononoke. There's a lot of great filmmaking and a lot of great animation. There's a lot to appreciate about character design and tone and music. There are some great filmmaking elements in this film, but I did not really connect with it because the characters and story were boring. It very much felt like Miyazaki just going through the motions and doing the things that he's kind of expected to do at this point. I was most entertained whenever a new character design would show up on the screen, and I would go, wow, that's really super interesting and well animated, and I love the way it looks. But most of the movie is not that. Most of the movie is a lot of nothing in between those types of scenes. It's very repetitive. It's fine. It's a very well-made movie that doesn't serve a huge purpose and just kind of exists. Six out of ten, but a low six. It is closer to a five than a seven. If you want to hear me talk about this more, TIFF 2023 review on my channel. Thank you. Out of all the nominations, I guess Spider-Verse is my preferred choice because it's really between that and the boy and the heron. I don't think it's going to anything else. We shall see. It would be absolutely crazy if Robot Dreams won, but it's not happening. Elemental would be embarrassing, and I don't think it's going to Nimona. All right, let's talk about best documentary feature. 20 Days in Mariupol is a very depressing movie. It is not for the faint of heart. There is a lot of disturbing imagery that even if I described it, I would probably get demonetized, so I guess, I guess not. A lot of real tragic consequences of war. It's very shocking and very sad. From a filmmaking perspective, it's a little repetitive. Presentation-wise, it's decent. The whole film really rides on the horrific things that it's showing. And in that sense, it still very much works, but this is not the type of movie that anyone's gonna wanna watch more than once. Pretty sad. Seven out of 10 for this film. Bobby Wine, the people's president, I did not see yet. Looks kind of boring. <laughs> Four Daughters, directed by Kather Ben Hania, is a very interesting film. It is very inspired by Abbas Kiarostami type movies. It is kind of a hybrid documentary, but also not a documentary. And there's actors, but the actors are playing characters that really do exist in real life at points. But it's also about the production of the thing that they're doing with the actors, but also some of the people are playing themselves. It's very meta and very interesting and very weird. This is also the same director as The Man Who Sold 
called His Skin, which was also nominated for an Oscar, but was not a documentary, and it was nominated for International Feature in 2021. I really enjoyed that movie, so it's cool seeing her nominated for something else and also something completely different. There's a couple issues I have with this film. The pacing could be a bit more tight, and there are some kind of cheesy music choices here and there, but it makes for a very interesting character study of real people. Very compelling, very emotional, and very substantive TIFF video. If you want to hear more, click the TIFF video. 7 out of 10. Loved it. Check it out. To Kill a Tiger, I did not have time to watch before finishing this video. It looks sad. Uh, didn't watch it. And since we're on the topic of documentary features, I should mention that Kokomo City was great. It was not nominated. It's a very indie, low-budget documentary that interviews black trans sex workers. It has a great sense of humor. It has lots of character. It's a little rough around the edges when it comes to the production elements. I mean, the low budget really shows on this one. But it is a very watchable and very enjoyable film and a pretty fantastic documentary at that. 8 out of 10 for Kokomo City. Really enjoyed it. Wish it got nominated, but uh, the Oscars are dumb, so who cares? All right, let's talk about the best international feature film category. Io Capitano, directed by Matteo Garrone. No idea if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Mamma Mia. Now, I really love this director. He did a really great job with the 2019 Pinocchio film. Dogman was also pretty great, and his 2012 film Reality is probably my favorite, and uh, uh, I don't know why it's slept on so much. Much like his other films, his visual directing style is pretty top-notch. There's a great sense of flow to the camera movements, there's some really incredible eye-catching shots, there are vibrant colors that really pop throughout the film. This is a film that starts out with a story that feels as though it could be super cliched and basic, but it really separates itself from other films covering the same subject matter. The story, the characters, the conflict, it's all so well captured and communicated. It is a super professionally made film that is both intense and emotionally brutal. It's probably not for the faint of heart as some pretty disturbing things happen in this film. Now, unfortunately, it did lose me a little closer to the end. There was a sequence that felt a little too elevated to the point of it being phony, like there was already enough conflict and they just added one too many pieces. But despite this, I really love the way it ended, and most of the film is honestly pretty incredible. There are some really powerful choices and there are scenes that really linger with you. For the most part, the original script score was pretty fitting and complimentary, although as it got close to the end, I do wish it was a bit more restrictive in terms of how often it was used. Overall, this was a really great film, so please check it out whenever you can, and I'm giving this a 7 out of 10. It's closer to an 8 than a 6. Perfect Days, directed by acclaimed German director Wim Wenders, is a very nice, digestible, calm, relaxing movie. It's set in Japan. The main character doesn't talk very much, but he's very enjoyable to follow. There's a classic rock-type soundtrack that plays throughout the film. If you want to hear me talk about this more, check out my TIFF 2023 video. Otherwise, I would recommend this film, and I'm giving it a 7 out of 10. Society of the Snow is from Spanish director J.A. Bayona, who has made quite a few films, but nothing that has ever really connected with me that much. I, I guess outside of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, because it was so funny bad that it was incredible. This is a film that is based on the same real-life event as the 1993 film Alive, and although I haven't seen that film, the consensus seems to be that this one is a lot less cheesy and sensationalist take on the story. I should mention that this film is also nominated for Best Achievement in Makeup and Hairstyling. I really enjoyed this film and how things were presented. It is very disturbing and emotionally brutal, and despite its brutality, it somehow doesn't feel insensitively gratuitous. The acting is great. The absolute horrors that these people went through were pretty fucked up, and it's captured really well in this. It is insane insanely gripping and well-paced, especially considering the two and a half hour runtime. It is very watchable, it is very well shot, there's a great sense of detail and commitment. It's a film where you can really tell that the filmmakers actually cared about presenting this story faithfully. There are smart transitions with visual consistency, the music was very fitting and appropriate, and it really helped with the disturbing tone of the film. I really enjoyed this movie and it definitely left an impression on me, so check this one out whenever you want, it's on Netflix. 
six. And I'm giving this one an eight out of 10. It's closer to a seven than a nine. The Teachers' Lounge is a German drama where a teacher tries to figure out who is stealing money in the school. The film is shot in a four by three aspect ratio, and it really complements the tone of tension and anxiety. The soundtrack was also very complimentary towards this tone, and although some parts of it felt a little repetitive, it was overall a very fitting addition. There are great performances throughout this film, and none of the child actors were bad, at least from what I can tell with the language barrier. There are really fantastic and natural interactions between her and her class. There's a great flow and pacing to the conversations, especially. There are memorable and distinct characters. The character dynamics are really interesting and well thought out. And the story is very well written with a satisfying sense of direction. Every element of filmmaking adds to the tension that builds up over the course of the film. It's a really great watch, so check this one out whenever you can. And I'm giving this one an 8 out of 10. The Zone of Interest. I already talked about that one. Sorry. Now, you might be wondering why Anatomy of a Fall is not on this list, considering it is nominated for five Oscars, including Best Picture. And that's because the Best International Feature Film category is one where each film has to be approved by the government of that country. Like, the government of the country is submitting these films, and each country is only allowed to submit one per year for the category. And with the director, Justine Trier, having said some things critical of the French government at Cannes, they did not take too kindly to that and decided to nominate another movie. Apparently this exact same thing has happened before. It's kind of stupid. And it's also dumb because it's not like there can't possibly be more than one good movie from a country that's not the United States in a year. But the Oscars doesn't know that these movies exist unless they're shoved in front of their faces. If you don't have a four-year consideration campaign, you can kiss your chances of getting Oscar nominated goodbye. The Academy is apparently not made of film enthusiasts that would be aware of what movies came out in a year. Nope, you have to specifically tell them otherwise they won't see it or won't remember that it came out or won't know that it existed. I've ranted quite a few times about the categories that I'm thinking of ending things should have been nominated for. Whether or not you enjoy that film, the makeup was absolutely incredible, but uh, Netflix did not include that film in their For Your Consideration campaign, so the Oscars didn't know it existed or forgot it existed or didn't care. It's really dumb. There's a couple films that were shortlisted for the international category that I really wish were nominated. One of those is Fallen Leaves, directed by Aki Korosmaki. It is a Finnish comedy, drama, dramedy. It's 81 minutes. It's very uniquely presented, endlessly fascinating. I'm really looking forward to seeing this one again. I talk about it more in my TIFF 2023 video. Definitely check this one out. 7 out of 10, closer to an 8 than a 6. For some reason, Godland was on the shortlist for this year, even though I watched it in 2022, but I guess it didn't get an American release until 2023. This is from Icelandic film director Hilner Palmason. And quite honestly, I think that this film is better than every single other nominee in this category, other than The Zone of Interest. It is absolutely beautiful and breathtaking. Everything feels so incredibly genuine. It is just dripping with authenticity and character. It is super well made, and so much talent and ambition went into making this film. Can't wait to see it again. If if you want to hear me talk about it more, then check out my TIFF 2022 video. 8 out of 10, closer to a 9 than a 7. I should also mention About Dry Grasses by Turkish director Nuri Bilge Ceylon. It was submitted by Turkey and it didn't even make the shortlist for some reason. And I am just now realizing that he's never been nominated for an Oscar ever, which just seems insane to me. His films are often slow, but super incredibly well made. The cinematography is absolutely incredible. No idea why that didn't get a nomination. You could easily bump out Maestro for that one. There's so much purpose and intent. It is absolutely astonishing just how well made this film is. The characters are super well written and feel like real people. It is bold. It is risk taking. It is memorable. It is thought provoking. Absolutely loved this movie. It is also better than all of the current nominations aside from the zone of interest. No idea why it's not even shortlisted. Maybe the Academy doesn't watch movies that are submitted by Turkey for some reason. No idea what's going on there. Very intelligent, incredibly made film. Love this director. The Academy Stinky. 
Flamin' Hot was nominated for Best Original Song, and I don't know why, because the song sucks. It's terrible. I watched the movie, mostly because it's odd that it even exists, and it was way, way worse than I possibly could have imagined. This sells itself as being the true origin story of Flamin' Hot Cheetos, although apparently the whole thing's made up anyway. A lot of conflicting information, nobody can really verify anything that happened in this movie, and when you watch it, it makes a lot of sense because the entire film is just oozing with inauthenticity. Nothing in this film sounds or feels natural at all. Here, tell all your homegirls. Look, maybe I don't got no diploma, but I got a PhD. Hmm. I'm poor, hungry, and determined, sir actual cringe and they do the trope of someone acknowledging that it's a bad line. Someone says, well, that's just stupid. That means it's okay to have bad writing. The entire thing is honestly just corporate propaganda. The entire goal of the movie is just to drill into people's minds that if they just work super hard and are the best worker ever for their employers, then they'll be rich and famous. The American dream. I want you to think like a CEO. Think like a CEO. There's no next step for guys like us. If there was a next step, you would have had Lonnie's job a long time ago. You ain't wrong. But did I let that stop me from being the best damn worker here? Yeah, just bend over backwards to appease your corporate overlords and you totally won't get screwed over. You're totally not replaceable. They'll listen to your ideas. Just climb up the ladder from being a janitor. All you gotta do is work hard. If somebody isn't a CEO, it's because they're not working hard enough. We live in a meritocracy. Just pay out of pocket for a commercial. You should pay out of pocket and you'll if you do that and you're just the best, most obedient person to the company ever, you'll get rewarded. Rewarded. You pay for the commercial. What an inspirational story. They also screened this film at the White House. Joe Biden gave a very funny speech. You can watch that whole thing on the YMS Highlights channel. It's very insane. Everything about this movie sucks. The writing sucks. The acting sucks. The editing sucks. The music sucks. The sound mixing sucks. Good looking kid. Yeah, smart too. Yeah. But I wasn't a white kid. That's way too loud in the mix. Try again. There's no sense of pacing or timing or planning in the filmmaking. There are ideas in the film that require a level of timing and the editing of this film makes it incredibly clear that they had absolutely no idea how what they shot was going to translate into the final product. Yeah, let's film an entire one -er and then oops, we realized that it doesn't make any sense pacing wise. Let's just speed a bunch of this up. Oh, it's so funny that white people are acting to his Mexican accent voiceover. Nah, big homie, we still got the good stuff. Let's just freeze the frames because we didn't think about how we were going to time this until we were in post. There is not one good performance in the entire film, which is very indicative of a bad director. Not even Tony Shalhoub could save the movie. His performance felt weak and uninspired. Did you know that the origins of the Flamin' Hot Cheetos, it's all totally all natural ingredients, y'all. Except their ingredients? came in test tubes and syringes. It's literally just a bunch of bullshit. It's a scam. It's fake. It's propaganda. It is pretending to be a progressive, inspirational story about a person of color making it in America. And it's literally just corporate propaganda. It's disgusting. The visual effects were horrendous. Terrible. Everything was terrible. And the song that was nominated only played in the end credits. Hold your back. Awful song, really basic bitch-ass composition. The nomination honestly just feels like nepotism. I don't know if fucking PepsiCo paid for the nomination or why it's here. This film is an easy, easy one out of 10. Cancer, absolute cancer. It is bad on every level. It's a genuinely disgusting film. Fuck this movie, the end. If you're morbidly curious about this film and you wanna suffer through it with me, I did a watch along on the YMS Watch Alongs channel. You can watch the film with me if you'd like. It's terrible. Don't say I I didn't warn you. May December is the new Todd Haynes film and it is nominated for Best Original Screenplay. And I almost forgot to talk about this one because I thought it was nominated for more than that, but I guess I just forgot. It honestly seems kind of crazy that it doesn't have any acting nominations. Julianne Moore was fantastic. It is very well directed. I really loved the music and how it was used. The presentation of the film evokes a weird kind of nostalgic feeling. I really love how the characters are handled in this film. This is the 
type of movie where even the side characters feel like very real people, and the main performances are honestly very detailed and well realized. It's one thing to just show a character's emotions, but this film is able to show performances where you can tell what the character is hiding. You can feel what the character is trying not to show, and it's done so in such a subtle and intelligent way. I absolutely love the writing in this film. There is a lot to chew on, it is very substantive, it is very meta. It is a character study in which one of the characters is trying to perform as another character and thus studying that character to get into the character. There are parts of the film where characters talk about the discomfort that they've experienced while filming certain types of film scenes, and I absolutely love how the meta nature of the film itself plays into that. And don't get me wrong, this definitely isn't a film where they're just constantly nudging and winking and breaking the fourth wall like Deadpool or some shit. This is a film that has layers and rewards you for thinking about it. The situation that this film sets up is very emotional and disturbing. The dynamics of the characters give so much to think about both intellectually and emotionally. It is super interesting, it is super engaging, it is challenging, it is controversial. I really loved this movie and I'm glad I watched it. I wish it had a Best Picture nomination. It would be really easy to get Maestro. <laughs> Just get Maestro out of there, honestly. What are you doing? Get the fuck out of here. Go away. Get out. Get out. Get out of my life. Incredible movie, and I can't wait to see it again. Nine out of ten for this film. Definitely top five of the year for me right now. Great stuff. I really wish Matt Johnson's Blackberry was nominated for anything. The screenplay was definitely better than The Holdovers, and if it were in the adapted category, then it was better than American Fiction for sure. The original score by Jay McCarroll was better than American Fiction and Indiana Jones. Five. Glenn Howerton was great in the movie, but yeah, this didn't have a huge campaign or anything, so the Academy might not have noticed that it was a movie that came out. Very funny film, very watchable. Check out Matt Johnson's other stuff. Nirvana the Band the Show is one of the funniest things ever. I love it. 7 out of 10 for Blackberry. It's closer to an 8 than a 6. Hundreds of Beavers! Not exactly an Oscar movie, but I loved it. It's playing in theaters in select cities right now. You should really check it out. Very funny film. I've seen it like six times, unironically. The the music was also incredible. Again, you could really easily bump out Indiana Jones and American Fiction for this. Great score for this film. The sound design choices were great. I don't know if the Academy would ever consider something like this, but you know. 9 out of 10 for Hundreds of Beavers. Check it out. Alright, and I guess just to wrap things up because uh, I ran out of time and I want to get this video out before the Oscars, so I might wind up watching some of the short films on the Watchalongs channel between now and then, but uh, they won't be in this video because that's how time works. Anyway, that's about it. That's all I have to say about the Oscars stuff until the actual Oscars happens. Remember, I am doing a live stream during the Oscars. We're gonna be live commentating the Oscars. Sunday, March 10th. It will be streamed on this YouTube channel and my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash ymsplays. Drop by, have some fun. I'll read the super chats after. Thank you for watching. And the Academy is stinky. Bye-bye.